Welcome to any of you who are joining us. This is our special Observe the Moon Night Hangout number one. Um, we are bringing you the moon from the Asia Pacific region and we actually have this beautiful view brought to us by Paul Stewart and it's coming to us from New Zealand. Um, it, Paul, do you want to introduce yourself to the, to the Hangout? Yep, yeah, I'm Paul and I'm down here in the lower heart, in the middle of the South Island of New Zealand under a reasonably clear sky. What type of equipment are you using this evening? This image is coming through a 80 mil refractor and this image is coming through the 12 inch mead. Oh, you are spoiling us, Paul. That's that's. I, a I thought stunning you only had one. Image. You snuck up on a second telescope. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> that's just absolutely amazing. So you can see in this image a section of craters. Uh, you can see some linear features where there's various faulting along the surface. You can actually see one section where the land appears to have perhaps slumped, creating. Um, this this line cutting through the landscape um, it's it's just a beautiful beautiful area along the Terminator which is that line between lightness and darkness on the moon uh, I love how just you can still see the atmosphere we are this is live we are on earth <laughs> and <Yes. laughs> some, of, some of us are on earth but so, you, know, you can see the atmospheric distortion going on as the light's bending along with it from the moon all the way here, all the way to there. Because we will be here for around 24 hours on and off throughout the day to share not only the images of the moon that from wonderful people from across the globe, but also our stories of what observing the moon means to, to all of us. So what... What this is all about, basically, is, is acknowledging that this is one planet. We all share one satellite. It looks upside down to those of them in New Zealand, and it looks upside down to us, depending on who you're talking to. And, and we all have our own cultural myths. We all have our own stories that we learn as small children about the rabbit, the old man, the cheese, all these different things that, that are part of the non-science heritage of the moon. But at the same time, our world has been working to explore the moon in, in unprecedented detail in the, the past decade, where we have the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter taking images at such high resolution that a basketball player laying on the surface of the moon and assuming the snow angel position would actually be visible in in the images coming back to us from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. We've had Chandrayaan from, the in, from India, a, a multinational collaboration led by the Indian Space Agency. We've had uh, Shang'i from China, Kagoya from Japan. Nation after nation has been launching missions as we work to understand our nearest neighbor in in amazing detail and we're starting to make discoveries of of water in the craters of um, one of my favorites is there's actually volcanoes on the moon they're dormant but they're there and it's this amazing geologic repository of all the history that the rain the storms the the dust has all erased here on the surface of our own planet yeah, it really is a great um, just way of seeing history through, you know, as far as cosmic history in our solar system. We don't get to, you know, we recover here on Earth. You know, the Earth is, is active, it's moving, it's, it's got an active geology, so there is volcanism going on. On, on the moon, There's it's not, it's dormant now, yeah. and there's no atmosphere, so there's nothing to burn up those, those meteors coming in, those meteoroids that hit it. They just pound in, and they stay there for millions and billions of years. And, and what's amazing is just looking at this simple image, this first quarter moon, um, we can see some of that geologic diversity. There's this bright white crater in the upper right, and don't try and say that too quickly. And uh, those white rays splattering away from the crater, that, that's actually a fairly young crater. 
and you end up seeing those splatter patterns because that's material that got flung up and flung out as the impactor transferred all of its energy into liquefying and digging up the surface of the moon. In other places we see the beautiful black layering of material and that's actually a type of lava on the moon from when the surface was liquefied and oozing out across the surface. And where we see more craters, that's older terrain. Where we see fewer craters, that's younger terrain. And what what would you say is young to the moon? <laughs> I know we, we all say these words young and, and old, but when we're talking about the universe, what yeah. would be young for the moon? Well, so so our moon it is only about 4.5, 4.6 billion years old, we think. We're still working on age dating it. And uh, it, it's had a temperamental history, but luckily things have calmed down in the past few uh, couple hundred million years. So the, the newest large craters we think are roughly 300 million years old. Um, so when we say young, young is, well, 300 million years out of 4.6 billion years. And, and while the largest fresh craters are measured in hundreds of millions of years, the moon is still getting hit today. And there's actually been recent activity where uh, amateur astronomers have been lucky enough to catch the flash of impacting objects. And That's awesome. It, it's we're hoping to be able to compare images over time to look for where when you compare images suddenly one of those images has something the other one doesn't. And this is this is the way that any of you out there with cameras can get involved. Imagine being the person taking the picture like Peter's taking right now and you see this beautiful illuminated side of the crater and I just love the color in his image. This is this is spectacular. Um, but imagine you're looking at, at the dark half of this image and suddenly where there's moon but it's not illuminated by the sun there's a flash from something impacting. That's actually possible to see. So that's your new uh, your new mission, Paul, is to catch <laughs> catch the flashes of meteoroids hitting hitting the moon. All right. Okay, I'll get on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all laugh, but uh, there there's a new mission that's going to be launched, Laddie, and it's going to be working to study the ever so thin and diffuse atmosphere of the moon and one of the things that it's going to be looking for is changes in that atmosphere that are triggered when there's an impact event and the thing is in order to know that any changes we see were triggered by the impact event we have to observe those impact events so this is a new form of citizen science that's going to to be possible um, once that mission is happily orbiting and sending data back to us here on the planet earth yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's wonderful on how many so-called amateur, I, I'm not a huge fan of that word, but amateur astronomers yeah. have been making all these phenomenal discoveries, whether it be deep, you know, deep sky objects or the impact that happened on Jupiter, what, last week? Yeah. That, that was observed by an amateur astronomer, not an observatory, and that's, that's phenomenal. So we do have people across the globe that are set up with their DSLR, their webcams, their their telescopes of differing uh, sizes or types, and they're able to capture part of cosmic history that we typically wouldn't be able to get on our own because there is a lot that has to be done to point a larger telescope at an object and timelines that have to be made and things like that. So it really is in our court we get to go and find the wonderful things out there that happen as they're happening. And and the thing to, to think about is if the idea of getting engaged in doing science is something that interests you, go out, look, look up, take video of Jupiter, take video of the moon, be one of the people out discovering things from your driveway. But on those cloudy, rainy, awful nights, well, go inside, and we have plenty of science that you can do over on CosmoQuest. We, we work with a project uh, called uh, Moon Mappers, and it takes some of those high-resolution images we've mentioned from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it puts them up online and invites you to, well, explore the surface of the moon. And 
I'm going to actually try and screen share over to, to show you what I'm talking about. Oh, I was actually beating you to it right Okay, now. go for it. So, so here is uh, man versus machine, I think. No, you already marked a crater is what it is. I just marked a crater. Okay. And I can't see my screen share, so I'm just going to be marking craters while you're going. That that's that's perfectly <laughs> fine. So so this interface is presenting images of the lunar surface that the highest resolution images you're looking at are less than half a meter per pixel. So the these are images they're uh, 450 pixels across that makes them well that makes them 225 meters, which is is like less than three football fields in, in length across. Uh, so this is a very small postage stamp of the moon that you're looking at. By marking these craters, we're helping to refine our understanding of the age of the moon in different places. And preliminary results that our science team has found from the work people have already done in moon mappers is showing that when you do careful study with these modern images, we're able to radically change our understanding of the ages of some sections of the moon around where the Apollo landers landed. Now this is really important work to be doing because the only places in our solar system that we are able to calibrate our crater count derived relative ages to the actual ages of things in the solar system is where we got rocks. You pick up a rock, you carry it home, you take it to a laboratory, and in the laboratory you, uh, well, you tear it apart and figure out what are all the radioisotopes and the daughter atoms in these rocks. And by counting those atoms, you're able to figure out what is the radioisotope based date of that rock. Once you have that date, you know how old that region of the moon is that you picked the rock up from. And one rock at a time, several thousand to million crater counts at a time, we're slowly able to say this section of the moon has this many craters, it has these rocks, therefore where you see this many craters you have this real age of an object in our solar system. So you guys are helping us redefine how we understand the moon and so if you can't see the beautiful views that Peter's bringing us tonight this is a way that you can go and you can get engaged in doing lunar science. Yeah, it's, it's great. I've been um, pushing it in there with my planetary science class. So I've, I've got around 109 planetary astronomy students, uh, students right now. And one way that I'm offering them extra credit for this course is for International Observe the Moon Night. So later on this evening for us, now that it's into the 22nd, they are able to observe yeah. and sketch, but also being able to do actual science so they'll be able to go through on on the moon and now that we have we have Vesta and ice investigators but primarily the moon going through yeah. and and mapping these craters and these features and learning the terminology while they're going along not really you know confusing them into hey you're actually learning awesome stuff this is really cool because no student wants to know that they're learning but you're, you're able to go through and join this huge community of from across the globe, it's it's not just an American thing. It is no. from people from all over the world that have contributed to this ongoing research, and we're always being able to redefine or even more precisely refine what we know. All you know in every science field, but in this particular one, we're able to find our closest neighbor that we've had mythologies about and how they're gods and the the you know cause for omens and bad times well now we're able to have a, a highly intimate knowledge of what it really is and what it has done over billions and billions of years and it, what what's awesome as as Scott was saying is this is a global endeavor science because of the internet has been liberated from the ivory tower it is no longer something that major contributions can only come from from professors working in universities using university equipment that's never been wholly true but it's getting easier and easier 
for people who don't necessarily have dark backyard skies, who don't necessarily own telescopes and cameras to find their own ways to get involved using the internet, using things like moon mappers. And um, it, like we always joke, we are the cloudy night activity and, and I fear that New Zealand is actually suffering from, from a bit of passing cloud. How are your skies looking, Peter? Or Paul, I'm sorry, right. I renamed you. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Paul, how, yeah. how is it looking? It's starting to get a bit cloudy out there now. Uh, well, at least... So, um, no, go ahead. I, at least it looks like it's clearing off a little bit. It, it's frustrating. But it's still kind of pretty, too, seeing... Yeah. The, the disturbances of the clouds and the just how much light is actually being reflected off the moon. That is always something yeah. that, you know, these are photons that started off at the sun and they're just being bounced off. And that's really, really cool when you think about it as little tiny packets of light being shot across the solar system. And we, we get to see light from all sorts of different things really close up or from really, really far away and really, really long time ago. So, so one of the, the interesting questions we of, often face is what good is it observing the moon from the surface of the Earth when we have lunar reconnaissance orbiter observing it up close when um, the, my favorite one is, well, can't the Hubble Space Telescope just look at the moon? And no, no, it can't actually. Uh, here on Earth, we have one of the only global, or at least half global, perspectives on the moon that we can get. Uh, spacecraft that are orbiting it are too close. They only get close-in views of the surface of the moon. They can't get that global perspective. Um, so when we're trying to get this, this global understanding, it's in some ways easier to do it here from the surface of the planet. We stitch and stitch and stitch and stitch images together from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to build beautiful global maps. But there's a certain artistry that comes from looking through the atmosphere. Uh, one of the other benefits of looking through the atmosphere is it also tells us something about our own world in some ways. If any of you have ever been able to go out and watch a lunar eclipse, uh, not all lunar eclipses look the same, and they don't even look the same to people in, the, in, in different places when they're looking at the same eclipse, because as the light travels through our atmosphere, it's scattered. And this scattering depends on, well, did a volcano go off recently? Uh, have there been massive dust storms? And all of that stuff floating around in our atmosphere actually affects what color the, the eclipsed moon will appear, and we can learn something about our atmosphere from looking at the moon. Now, we are trying to get other observers in who hopefully have slightly clearer skies. Uh, I was misnaming Paul Peter because we, we are expecting Peter Lake to be joining us, and I just decided for whatever 2 a.m. reason that they were both named Peter this evening. Um, and, and we well, now have a very bright moon back. Now, Paul, when you were growing up, were you told any stories about the moon, whether it be a man in the moon or rabbits, or is there anything that stood out to you regarding, you know, just looking up and being curious about it? No, I wasn't really told much about the moon when I was growing up. Just did did of... you have the same cheese mythology that we have here? <laughs> yes, I heard the cheese mythology, yep. But yeah, no, it wasn't until I really got into astronomy that I started looking up at the moon. Do you do you remember the first time you looked at a moon through the telescope? Looked at the moon through a telescope. <laughs> no, that was a long time ago. I'm trying, to th I'm trying to think, my first time looking through some optics. Uh, I was, I'd have been maybe seven. And it was it was always interesting because yeah we how often if you're not engaged in 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 astronomy or in astronomers you you typically take it for granted you you see yeah there's something there it's up in the sky it, we don't know why it's changing its shape but it's it's nifty but when you actually get get to see the features and see the shadows from you know, from the uh, from the craters that have formed, or the different colors from the ejecta, it's 
it, it makes you think in a way that you don't typically think about it and say, hey, that's not just a, a circle. It's not a two-dimensional circle. Now you can see it as a sphere that has all these, this dynamic geography that's going on with that, or geology. And that's something that always stuck with me is seeing any object, especially the moon, in a new light of, hey, there's actually a lot of things going on. And I didn't know what it was. And it took me a long time to actually figure out what it was to ask those questions. But I always thought that was really interesting, watching it transition from a flat disk into a sphere just by looking at it through a telescope. Yeah, that that's one of the really cool things. And it's only been a little over 400 years since we had that first telescopic view. Uh, we celebrated that back in 2009, so it's now been 103 years that that we've understood there's mountains there. There's there's these weird, crazy dips that it took us forever to figure out. Well, not forever. It took us a while to figure out what they are. And uh, it, the more we look, the more we learn. Uh, one of the coolest things to me about the moon um, I, I, I'm a fan of volcanoes, what can I say? I love it when mountains decide to like expel stuff into the atmosphere as long as there's no airplanes involved. So, so volcanoes are awesome as long as they're not in major uh, air traffic patterns. <laughs> um, but the moon is a perfectly great place to, to have volcanoes that don't affect air traffic patterns. Unfortunately, they're not currently erupting, but there are lava tubes on the moon from various um, Volcanoes on the moon weren't like we're used to thinking about on, on Hawaii or in Indonesia where, where you see these, these lava fountains shooting up into the atmosphere. On the moon it was much more of ground leaks and oozes volcano out across the surface and there are some shield volcanoes there. And as, as we look out across the surface, scientists have been able to identify lava tubes that just like in Hawaii, these are places where as the lava um, spread across the surface, the outer part of a tube solidified first and the lava continued to travel and as it continued to travel it eventually stopped coming out and left this empty tube behind. Well there are scientists that are looking for what are called skylights, places in the lava tubes where the ceiling is caved in and we're able to look down into these underground caves and these caves represent one of the cheapest places that we can build a human colony because the, the soils help protect you from solar radiation and other radiation that you have to worry about in space. Well at the same time you have your walls already carved out for you, you just slap in a layer of um, pressurizing material and uh, you're good to go. It's, it's, it's a much cheaper and easier way to build a colony is to just take advantage of existing caves. So this is, this is another way that you can get involved in science is helping to look for these, these skylights in the bottoms of craters and lava tubes. And how awesome would that be to go spelunking on the moon? I mean really yeah, see, I have to admit, I, I actually am one of these people whose skin slowly starts to crawl the longer I'm underground. I, I think I set some sort of a land walking speed record for <laughs> Carlsbad Cavern at some point. So I'm going to mightily cheer on other people spelunking on the map. Uh, I'll do it. I mean, I, I was a firefighter, so I can be in tight space with having a huge suit on me anyway. So I'm ready to go, NASA. If you want to spelunk on the moon, <laughs> I will be there. I just want to know where all the heat necessary and all the water necessary to make the spelunking part possible on the moon is going to come from. That's a great question. <laughs> I think you know, we'll have engineers, right? That's what engineers are for. <laughs> you're you're going to make a spelunking amusement park on the moon. <laughs> well, yeah, and then we can have whaling on the moon, right? Yeah, no. For spelunking. <laughs> Futurama reference, I'm sorry, everyone. Oh, okay. I completely that... missed it. I just lost nerd points. <laughs> <laughs> it's been stuck in my head all day, getting ready for this hangout with it's... whalers on the moon. <laughs> so, so, uh, Paul, it, how often do you, as, as you get your beautiful optic systems out, how often do you just take a look at the moon? Well, I normally look up every night to see what the moon's doing. Make sure it's not going to get in my road for the night. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you observe 
pretty much every night, Paul? Uh, the weather allows me. I'm out here. What a guy. I. That's. I wish I could do that. I, I really. Yeah. I've, I've, I've. I'm so busy, and I know so many people that you know are that are Sean. I was t- talking with Corey earlier tonight, and he's like, "Clear skies," but I'm so tired. Oh yeah. But I. I know I was talking with you earlier, Paul. That's that's wonderful that you are able to go out and just look up and be curious and look at wonderful things just because you can. That's that's the key thing. You're not doing it for fame or glory, at least that I know of. You might have this evil plan from New Zealand that I'm not aware of. <laughs> I'll have to let me in on it. But no, you're, you're just going out and looking up and looking at up just the amazingly beautiful universe that's around us. And not many people get to take advantage of that. So we have Ian Kath in uh, Australia pointing out that he's never understood the man in the moon reference, but he always saw the bunny rabbit on the moon. And I, I guess when you grow up with the moon in a completely different perspective, you don't see those two eyes and the mouth staring down at you. It's, it's different when you flip things upside down. I'm in the same boat as I never understood the man on the moon. Really? I, I, I really. I always remember that being told me it was the man on the moon. I always looked up and I didn't see it. I saw the rabbit as well. But I was I always like, oh, no, I can see it lying through my teeth so I didn't get made fun of. Oh, but, no, I'm trying to find yeah. a, a good picture of it now. Um, or at least a good picture of the moon. That, that isn't a first quarter. I, one of the things that I made the most profoundly stupid mistake on, on an exam that cost me like 20 points out of 100 was I'd, I had an exam that said you were standing in such and such a location on a path that is, and it gave the correct direction and orientation and time and said the moon is at first quarter, where is it in the sky? And I, I had this mental glitch and I'm like, okay, so if it's first quarter, then one quarter of it is illuminated. So it's a skinny crescent. And I did all the calculations for a moon that was seven days old. <laughs> and that was wrong. That was profoundly wrong. The reason that we call what we're seeing tonight first quarter, even though you see roughly half of the moon illuminated, is because it's a three-dimensional object. And we're seeing one fourth of that three dimensional object illuminated. So, so now you know. Don't make the mistake I made. <laughs> well, it, it's it's hard to think about it that way. You know, we we look up, and we only we see a circle. We don't yeah. necessarily see a sphere. And so, when you see half of that circle illuminated, it's very easy to think that's a half moon instead of a quarter moon. But half of it's always illuminated unless there's an eclipse going on. So half. Whether we see it or not, half of that spherical object is being illuminated by the sun. It's just a matter of where we're looking up at it and what we can see that's being illuminated. Yeah. And thinking about it that way, too, kind of blows your mind when you're not used to thinking in that three-dimensional terms of, no, there's, that's the same sunlight that we are getting during our daytime. It's daytime on the moon, and it's... There's this huge ball up in space that's going around, and we're just seeing it from from different angles. That's a really, really cool way of looking at it when you're not used to thinking it in that way. I remember yeah. that blew my mind, too. It's, yeah, and, and once you get used to the moon um, being up during daylight, that, that's another one of those things that really confuses people. The first time they realize, that's the moon. It's noon. What's it doing there? There's like this <laughs> betrayal. And no, it's just orbiting. It's fine. It has to get all the way around the Earth occasionally. Otherwise, it will fall out of the sky. So we want it to be visible during daylight. Um, but it, it's just kind of amazing how people react so differently depending on well, what they've been taught it's supposed to be. We teach a lot of mm-hmm. misinformation in schools. Yeah. And I, it's, I, I'm seeing a lot of it, actually. And regardless of what you feel about our education system here in the States, I, I, 
I think just being able to allow them to work through their misinformation. You know, I've, I've, I I tr try to like, no, but it's this. Well, that's not going to help them understand. So showing them and having them take you along their journey of misinformation and then they realize, wait, but this, I've reached a dead end. And then let's backtrack and find the correct way of going at it. It's just, it, it's wonderful watching that light bulb turn on for the first time. And it's no fault of theirs that they didn't. They just were taught incorrectly. Yeah. And it's okay to have been taught incorrectly, not necessarily by the person that taught them, but it's something that, hey, it's all right to be wrong because then you get to take this wonderful journey of learning the correct way or the, the most correctly known way of doing something. And I just had someone hold a – little I have a little moon squishy stress ball yeah and stood in front of the projector and just had them turn around in a circle and they get they saw the moon phases happen and first he moved clockwise like no no other way and but yeah I got to see it go through the phases and it just it clicked and it was wonderful and it made me happy and it made him happy too which is even better <laughs> So I have a picture of the full moon, and I'm going to screen share it and attempt, <laughs> attempt to explain how I see the man in the moon. And I have to admit, I'm someone who's capable of, uh, of finding faces anywhere. It's a special gift I have. Um, and of course, there, okay, you can see my mouth. My mouth. So this I see is the right eye. This is the left eye, and here's a mouth going, ooh, um, or some <laughs> other noise. And you can sort of see a nose here, and, and so that's just how I always saw it, was eye, eye, nose, a mouth okay. saying ooh. So it, it looks like a Jay Leno chin sticking it does. out to me now. Yes. Okay, I'm yeah. seeing... For the yeah, first time, a chin here. I'm, I'm 28 years old and I've now seen the man <laughs> in the moon. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that I could bring you such an esoteric thing. That's, um, that's wonderful. You are the best astronomy PhD person I've ever met because you've shown me the man in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so so the, the best thing is if you ever get to the southern hemisphere, we're, we're all used to learning our constellations. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're spoiled by having the Big Dipper or the Plow, which is almost impossible to miss. Down in the Southern Hemisphere, they have the Southern Cross. They, they have, um, uh, they have the, the mountain, which uh, it, it's Table Mountain from Cape Town, except up in the stars. Um, but they also have something unique. It's a dark, not quite constellation, but it's a dark pattern in the sky and, and one of the dark paths through the Milky Way, um, depending on what culture you're from, you see either an emu or a donkey or an ostrich or a llama, but it, it's awesome that these dark patterns also get turned into patterns that we, we see in the sky because human beings, well, we're capable of finding patterns almost anywhere, whether they're real or not. Absolutely. That's it's one actually the the things I like about Stellarium. It's a an open source planetarium software that's available for uh, Mac, Windows, or Linux. Yeah. But you can go through the constellations and not only see, at least to me, the Western, but you can see the different mythologies throughout throughout the generation, throughout the world, and see that hey, there other people have been looking up the same way that we have, but they get to see what's familiar to them. And it gives you an anthropologic look at astronomy as yeah. well, seeing what, the, what these wonderful, wonderful people that were curious looking up and saw. And it's, it's really interesting to look at it that way and see what we all get to look at it from a different perspective from where we're at. Of course we're going to see scales if you know, we're looking at Libra because we could be counting and weighing money or different products. Of course it's going to look like a scale. Or to somebody else, it'll look completely different. And and to to bring this this more to shadow, I guess, um, I found other people's ways of viewing the moon, and not just the man in the moon. 
so I don't know if that's screen sharing. I see my yep, own video I frozen. See it. Okay. So so here we have a different way of seeing the man in the moon where they put the second eye in a different place than where I see it. Um, then there's the much angrier southern hemisphere moon. <laughs> he he looks far more upset. Paul, uh, why is your moon so angry? <laughs> Oh, I don't nope. know. He may be frozen right now. Um, I love this one. It's a woman reading a book. Okay, yep. Very, very Victorian. And that's one that once you see it, you can't unsee it. But unfortunately, the moon is, is uh, screwly orientated to see it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, they call it a beetle. Personally, I think it's a very angry carpenter ant. Yeah, I see that. But definitely a bug. And then here's the rabbit in the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, St. George slaying the dragon. <laughs> that is wonderful. You will so, find anything. You know, you, you can find almost anything you want if, you know, given different shapes and there are so many different shapes on the moon just because there's been billions of years worth of impacts that, yeah, anything's going to pop up. Well, and, and what I love is, um, and I don't know if my video is unfrozen, but I still see it as frozen, so I'll go over I, to Paul. I see you. Okay. I see you. Okay, excellent. Uh, what, what I think is so interesting is as we've been able to send back maps from the far side of the moon, not the dark side, that, that's a great Pink Floyd album, but uh, has nothing to do with reality. The reality is half the moon is always illuminated, and there's no such thing as a, a permanently dark side, just a side that's dark right now. Um, but the far side of the moon, when we get back imagery of it, um, it's radically different than the side we see and one of the current theories is that when our moon was essentially splashed into existence when a Mars sized object hit the protoplanet Earth that that splashing of material formed a larger body and a smaller body that eventually came and smacked into what is now the far side of the moon creating an off-center center of mass and also creating one side that is extremely rough and another side that has all of this lava that has leaked through the surface to create, well, George slaying the dragon. And George is awesome for slaying that dragon. All dragons <laughs> need to, to be, in fairy tales, slain quite well. Yes. Um, Unless it's Trogdor, then Trogdor's okay. <laughs> Ian, I'm hoping we were able to, to a answer your question. Um, if any of you do have questions, Scott and I are both following the, the comments. Um, I admit my comments tracker seems to have just gone boink on me. Um, but you can either leave us questions by uh, using the hashtag on Twitter, Moon Knight, or by leaving us a comment on YouTube or on our event or, of course, on Google+. There's a, actually a really, really good question um, by... Uh, Hopefully, I'm not messing up your name. It's Anvar Kamalov. And he's asking, guys, why is no, is, um, I'm going to translate, it. is, are there any visible stars around the moon? Why can't we see any visible stars surrounding the moon when we look it's, up? It's a contrast issue. I'd, if, if you take a picture that allows you to see the stars, the moon is nothing but pure white to a digital camera. It's our eyes, we see logarithmically. This means that if something is 10 times brighter, we see it as one click on the dial up. If it's 100 times brighter, we see it two clicks on the knob up. So in order for something to appear twice as bright, it actually needs to get essentially 100 times brighter instead of two times brighter. It's this logarithmic scale that allows our eyes to see stars and the moon at the same time. Digital cameras don't work that way. They will blow out their optics getting an image of the stars and the moon becomes pure white. Um, 
if you turn down the the gain is what you turn down as well as the shutter speed there's there's an example there you actually start to be able to see the dark side of the moon when he does this um, it looks like there's there's too much haze to, to make out stars right now um, but the to the digital detector uh, it, everything's linear and and it's just not capable of getting the dynamic range of moon and stars all at the same time. Um, it runs out of place to store the data. Even if you stretch the image logarithmically, the way it obtains the data, it just it's like trying to fill a bucket. You can only put one gallon of water in a one gallon bucket and after that you might get a little bit extra because of surface tension, but not much. No, that is that's a great question, and especially yeah. when you hear so many people about uh, the, the moon landing conspiracies. Oh, I don't see any stars. Well, no, you're yeah. not going to. There is a contrast issue. If you're if you're driving down the road mm -hmm. and you're seeing headlights coming at you, you're not going to be seeing everything that's around you because you are being something so much brighter. You're not going to see dimmer lights until that passes. Right. Your eyes readjust, and now you're able to see a varying degree of brightness coming through. So do we have other questions from our audience? Let's see here. Um, have Jonas um, Kidane, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry if I'm messing up your guys' names, but um, it says, are there any new findings from the Grail mission about the moon's interior that he hasn't followed up since the launch? So there, I, there was a lunar science conference back in July that I was able to attend and uh, they've actually produced some really awesome maps of gravity and overlaying the uh, Lola maps which tell you the altitude of the bumps and jiggles and dips on the surface of the moon and what's really interesting is for the most part you see through the grail data you can see oh that lump in the, the center of a crater where there's a little bit of extra mass, they detect that. For the most part, you can see where the crater walls are. In the, there's a little extra mass causing a little more pull of gravity. But what's really awesome is you do see these places on the surface where there's more gravity but not more surface altitude indicating that the surface is, is um, hiding a higher density material underneath just like we have here on the earth in some places so it's it that was the preliminary findings back in July next week I'll be in Madrid for the European Planetary Sciences Conference and I am going to be looking to see what does Grail have to present and I'll be blogging all of that and tweeting all of that as much as I can and, and speaking of Twitter, if if um, if any of you on Twitter and aren't following us, we do have a lot of fun in a very scientific and nerdy way. Because go <laughs> go nerds. Yes. Um, Pamela is Star Strider with a Y, so at Star Strider, and I am the bald astronomer, or not the. I am at bald astronomer. Uh, another wonderful person to follow is Nicole Gallucci, which is Noisy Astronomer, and she'll be joining us later on on September 22nd, so today, now here throughout the United States, yeah. uh, for our ongoing coverage. Which Not in Hawaii. One. It's still yesterday in Hawaii. It is still yesterday in Hawaii. Sorry, Hawaii. You'll, it's coming soon, I promise. <laughs> I promise the 22nd will arrive. But we, we do have a lot of fun. We get to share. Um, we do share a lot about our citizen science projects going on over at CosmoQuest, and we there are multiple Twitter handles for the amazing things happening over at CosmoQuest. Uh, there's at CosmoQuestX, which is the Twitter account there. There is at Asteroid Mappers, at Moon Mappers, and you might get a little bit of drama going on between some of the. The there, there's there's been drama between between <laughs> asteroid mappers, which is uh, asteroid Vesta, and I am Ceres, because there's this little love triangle going on because the Dawn mission abandoned Vesta for a bigger rock, and and Vesta's heart was broken. Was well, it's, it's so. cold out there anyway, and she really got the cold shoulder. 
and just got ion engines in her face. And I mean, really, yeah. ion thrusters in your face is not a good data, good way to end a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we try and have fun with the science, we have fun with the observing. Um, we, we love the observers we get to work with, like Paul, like Peter Lake, like Mike Rector, like Stuart Foreman. I, there's so many of them, S Scott can name them more effectively than I can, I think. We, yeah, we do. We have a, a phenomenal group um, from all over the world. We, we have Ahmet Kale from Turkey. And we have Umer from Pakistan and Yuka Lakso from Finland. Then throughout the U.S., you know, we, we have Mike Phillips and we have Mitchell Duke from North Carolina. Uh, Gary. Chris Ridgway. Yeah, Gary, who's my neighbor practically. He's only around 20 miles away from me. And we just we have an amazing group that we get to work with every Sunday. We have our virtual star parties. And they, they literally share the, the cosmos with the entire world. So where we might be able to look up and see the moon or clouds, somewhere in the world there are going to be clear skies and we'll be able to show off what's out there. So, so we have David Trog asking us, assuming ideal conditions, how much does the atmosphere affect our view versus distance given current technology? Well, one of the problems that we deal with trying to look at the moon is it's not a point source. When light from a point source like a star passes through our atmosphere, we're able to use laser systems, we're able to use, uh, we're able to use um, sp special bright stars uh, to figure out how is the light as it passes through the atmosphere getting bent and twisted and distorted by the atmosphere. But that only really works with point sources super effectively. Moon is, is big, There's it tends to eat an entire field of view. Um, so trying to correct over that large of a field is something that we don't generally do very often. Um, there, there are telescopes that are able to, to correct over smaller fields and they'll correct things like galaxy images. Um, but in general, because we have the atmosphere, on average, so I'm not talking about professional sites, I'm talking about average observer on the planet Earth. Uh, if you were above the surface of the Earth, you'd be limited strictly by your optics. So you're looking at, um, well, a tenth of an arc second, which is a tenth of the size of a piece of hair held at arm's length, that sort of distortion above the atmosphere created by your optical systems. But here on the surface of the Earth, we're looking at three arc seconds of distortion. That's three pieces of hair held side by side at arm's length. So that's a kind of massive difference. Yes. Let's see. If, excuse me. Um, Actually, we have Caroline McArdle, that one I actually am better at pronouncing, um, said, do tidal motions affect Earth's climate? How different would Earth's climate be without the moon? Well, I, it, it doesn't affect the climate per se in terms of where is it warm, where is it cold, or the jet stream, but the moon does affect currents. Um, it does affect tides. and. Without the moon, it, it's unclear if a lot of the tidal basins that, that life relies on so much, um, without those tidal basins, life might have evolved in very, very different ways. So I don't think it's so much a climate issue as it is an issue of, well, what about all those critters that love to, to spend some time above water and some time buried uh, under the high tide? and. Um, yeah, so it, it's, I think it would much more drastically have affected our past to have not had the moon. Um, but our present is doing okay climate-wise with the moon. Uh, that's gr great to think about it that way. It's not something I'm typically used to thinking about. But yeah, it would actually you know, add a lot to the diversity of the evolution of life because now this, you know, this swatch of, of land, water area is now being introduced to different conditions daily yeah twice daily and yeah you definitely would have different formations of all sorts of life whether it be plant life or animal life and and there there's uh, things like the Bay of Fundy where you actually have essentially rivers reversing directions every twice Which a day. Is 
awesome. It, that it is so cool. It really is. Um, so we have more questions coming in. We have Ian Kath asked, uh, with current formation of Earth moon system be the cause of differences in Earth's crust components? No, actually the, the Earth's crust, while it is flexed by the tidal forces, um, one of the reasons that we do have the active plate tectonics that we have is because we're big enough that we retained our heat. Mars, uh, it's now felt, did have plates in the past, but it's cooled off sufficiently that it doesn't now. Um, Venus is just a weird sucker. Uh, it, it has 900 degree Fahrenheit surface, and it appears to periodically just undergo massive volcanism. So, so it's its own critter. Um, Mercury again, quite small, even though it's close to the sun, it's it's solidified. It's it doesn't have that um, molten core necessary to have the plates moving and shifting. So as long as we have active volcanism, as as long as we have hot springs and so many other things that make life interesting, um, we're going to keep having plate tectonics. So. It's, it's driven by leftover heat from the Earth's formation as well as by heat generated through the radioactive decay of um, all the naturally occurring radioisotopes within our soils and rocks. Some great questions coming in. You guys are awesome. <laughs> See, what are you um, seeing? I'm just all these questions are actually phenomenal, so I'm, I'm loving them. Uh, let see, Harry Harvey, Harvey. Um, is there any plan for a large-scale manned mission to the moon? Uh, plan, yes. Well-funded plan, no. Uh, so. I, have a plan, I have a plan for a large-scale manned mission, but I also think Newt Gingrich does too. So yes, that's true. So planned and practical and, and being able to be applied and put through. Yeah, so, so we do keep seeing renewed plans to have humans on the moon by 2020 or by 2030. The date keeps shifting. Um, I, I think the most realistic plans that I've seen so far is Japan has plans to get um, basically hominid robots, so robots that walk around like humans, on the surface of the moon um, with rovers to use basically as, as basic, think of it as robots on segways. Um, and, and that's a very, very simplified version of, of they were looking at building a robotic base on the moon. I can see that happening much lower cost and uh, much sooner. It's, it's a matter of cost more than technology right now, and that's one of the frustrations is the global economy really needs to get itself off the ground. Um, and, and it may end up being that the first major colony is actually a tourist trap hotel. <laughs> and I'm not sure how I feel about that, but if it drives getting scientists on the moon to be the people who are doing the, the afternoon talks for the wealthy people drinking their tea, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, you know, go along and help carry your props un until I have that, uh, that degree in hand for it. But <laughs> well, I'll, by the I'll, time we get there, you're going to have your PhD. I'll, so. I'll be great then. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Peter, just let me know, too. He'll be um, here in about half hour. He did okay. have to run about, but he will be back. Uh, let's see here. That's that's a great, uh, I guess I think a opinion question, but also logistics. Um, if we were to go back to the moon and make a base there, which area would be the best to settle in? So what we're looking at right now is is the Akin Basin in the South Polar region, and the reason that this is getting looked at is with this crater, you have splattered peaks that are permanently illuminated. So these are places that you can put solar panels, that you can put antennae, and the antennae would be in constant view of the planet Earth as they poke up above the pole, and the solar panels would be well in constant view of the sun since it's a constantly illuminated area. At the same time, down in the craters, you have constantly shadowed regions. And that sounds like a bad thing until you start thinking about trying to cool a colony. Um, it's it's easier to heat things up than cool them down. And by building in the crater, um, 
you're in constant shadow, the thermodynamics uh, is, is constant, you solve one direction, you don't have to solve heating and cooling, and uh, out of direct path to the sun can be good for other reasons as well. Building yes. into the side of crater walls gives you the opportunity to use rock as a natural radiation shield. Yeah, there's a lot of radiation out there. A lot yeah. of not so fun rate. We deal with great radiation. You know, that's how my food is cooked. You know, it's we, we and I don't own a microwave, but <laughs> I, I don't. But when we think about radiation, yeah, we we have it everywhere. But there's certain kinds. It's a fancy word for light. Yes. All, all light is radiation. There's the radiation we see all around us, which you're able to see me now. Then we're dealing with things like what Nicole uses, so radio light, which is very long. Radio wavelength. telescopes. And, and then we have X-ray, gamma radiation, which will just you know, shoot right through you. Yeah. And that's not Occasionally fun. destroy DNA. And, and then just to confuse people, there's alpha particles, which are just really high-energy naked helium nuclei. Uh, so those aren't light, those are a radioactive particle as opposed to being radiation, which is light. Um, so these, these are some of those things that are hard to keep straight because the words are just a little bit too similar and a lot of people say it wrong on TV and in newspapers. So radioactive particles like alpha particles um, are particles and uh, Radiation is just a fancy way of saying light. Electromagnetic spectrum is a fancy way of saying light. Um, yeah, it's it's all just light. And which is still awesome. That's that's really what majority of observation astronomy started with, just studying light. That's all we have. We can't go out there. We want to, <laughs> but we can study those photons that are coming in and being able to see what the light has done. We can see yeah. what hydrogen emits here on Earth and see, okay, well, we're looking at this specific part that's hydrogen, but why does it look different? Why is it redder? What, why is that a little different? Well, we can study the light, the properties of light itself, and we get to learn about entire galaxies just by knowing about light itself, which is, I think, amazing. I, I think that's one of the, the best things that allows us, as a, as a human species, we're tiny in the grand scheme, but learning about light allows us to understand the universe. And poof, that's that's what got me hooked, actually. It was That was that key right there, is the learning light lets us understand the universe. Well, and, and one of the things that it's easy to lose track of is it's only been 50 years that we've been able to get any understanding of other objects in our, well, in our solar system, let alone our entire universe, um, from something other than reflected starlight. All the information we had about the planets up until that point came from looking through telescopes, uh, from occasionally shooting radi radar beams, but 50 years ago we were still sorting that technology. So for the most part, everything we understood was from looking at sunlight uh, bouncing off of other planets, other moons in our own solar system, and by looking at light radiated from objects, um, other stars, galaxies, nebulas scattered throughout our galaxy and the universe beyond. But 50 years ago, Mariner 2 flew past Venus and broke the hearts of everyone who thought that it was a tropical world <laughs> um, by, by telling us it's 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and now, now we're like leaving a trail of dead robots on Mars, one scientific discovery at a time. Um, we have probes orbiting Saturn on their way to uh, the former planet, the classic planet Pluto. Uh, we have a mission orbiting Mercury. There's, there's so many things out there, Venus Express. Um, we're scattering high-tech metal bits everywhere and getting back data in return. Yeah, and when you put it that way, it's sad that we are leaving dead robots all over. But it's 
it's not like you know Marvin the paranoid android that's just being left in a car park for millions of years. <laughs> you know, we. <laughs> I what I love is that we have two generations of active robotics happening on Mars. Yeah. We, you know, we have um, we have opportunity still going while curiosity is just getting started, and I, I love the fact that you know MER was supposed to last ninety days. Yeah. That that's it. Ninety Mars days. That's all you have. Exploration rovers, uh, opportunity, and spirit. spirit. And only supposed to last 90 days back in 2004, and one of them is still going. And even Spirit lasted years. Yeah. You know, which is phenomenal. So. And, and it didn't die so much as it got stuck in the dirt, and they yes. couldn't unstick it, and it got stuck in the winter with its solar panels in the wrong direction. Uh, so it froze to death. It didn't. Well, it didn't break. It just got right. too cold. Um, it wandered too far from the plug, and the battery died, and we we couldn't k plug it back in to get it going. <laughs> yeah, it died a horrible, horrible engineering, um, lack of malfunction, death. Um, yeah, it's 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 the equivalent of the pickup marooned in the back pasture that no one does, that people just can't get it out. Right. Um, so so we have coming in on on Twitter. Um, Benjocks? I don't know if all those letters are pronounced or not, but there's a lot of X's. Um, he, he or she is asking, the moons around the solar system are very different. What does our moon tell us about the others? Well, e even though we see a whole variety of different moons in our solar system, at, at a certain point, um, they, they fall into three main categories. You, you have uh, rocky round things like our moon, um, you have icy round things, well, like like uh, Enceladus or Europa, and and then you have potatoes. Uh, these are the things that are too small to have reached hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, therefore, they never gravitationally were forced to collapse down to a, a nice round shape. Um, these different types of objects are all telling us if you get this big, this is what happens to your geology. If you have this mixture of internal chemicals, you somehow get Titan. If, if you take a rocky world and you squish it, squish it, squish it, squish it, um, you get a volcanic world like Io. So essentially, what we're doing is we're saying, take stuff, goop it together, put it somewhere. And let's see what happens. And, and our moon is the example of what happens when you take rocky object, put it in the inner solar system next to something that doesn't gravitationally do really bad tidal things to it. Um, it it's kind of awesome to look around the solar system and compare all the similar sized things. At a certain level, you have Mercury, the moon, Ceres, Titan, Ganymede. All of these large bodies um, scattered around different types of planets, um, Ceres out occupying the asteroid belt, and by looking at each of them within their own geologic context, we're able to start to understand, take this, put it here, this is what it undergoes. And, and so it's part of a piece of understanding, yes, all the moons are different, but why are they different? And studying it and all of the moons together allows us to answer the why. And that's really what science is interested in. Everything else is leaf collecting, which you have to start with. Yes. But, but after a while, you start doing genetic testing on your leaves. And, and as we start doing sample return missions, that's, that's our way of doing genetic testing on, well, not leaves, but moons. Yes. Well, I, I, I love, you know, that is a next big step for Mars, but we've got the next closest thing is we sent the lab there instead yes. of having it come back. We cheated. And yes, we did, but that's okay. You know, we, as long as we're not cheating the science portion of it, but you know, as far as where the science is happening. But yeah, we're, we're able to send an actual laboratory to a planetary body, and we can do that 
any of these rocky moons? You know, where where will the Sun dawn out and orbit Vesta the same way that the lunar reconnaissance orbiter is going over to the moon? So we're able to do the same types of imaging that we're doing close up, you know, close up on the moon, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers away in places in, in the asteroid belt and even further out, Voy Voyager's now at the edge of the solar system, which is insane to think about because it's so far away. We're able to do all these things, and all we can do is just get more and more information out of it. We get to understand more about what's in our neighborhood, yeah. let alone what's in the entire cosmos. So what I love is this this area of the moon that we're looking at now captures so much. Thanks, thanks for putting the telescope where you put it, Paul. Um, there's this in in the upper left. There's a nice bright white feature that's probably a young feature. Um, it looks like a pair of of very young craters side by side. Uh, this dark smooth area is where lava flowed across the surface and erased other craters. You see the raised section that's just beat to tar and. That beat up section, well, that's that's older terrain on the surface of the moon. And not everything in this image that clouds are demolishing. Um, some of that is is created by lava and deformation of the surface where it got wrinkled by this or that different process. Um, there are actual mountains on the moon. Um, so here we're looking at not just craters, but other geologic features as well. It's just a beautifully diverse area of terrain. Uh, and that's what I love is that there, there's so much diversity out there, and there's so much diversity even so close to us. You know, we think about the Earth and having just a, just a huge landscape of diversity as far as life and geology and minerals and elements. But even looking up at what looks like to be a great blob in the sky, that you get a look and you see that there's a lot going on. And the further out you look, you see that there's even more crazy, amazing, wonderful things out there that we don't get to see close up, with, you know, which is why having our virtual star parties are awesome. We're able to see planetary nebulae. We're able to see the future of our solar system because that's what's going to happen to our sun. Yeah. And which is fantastic. You can literally look into the future while looking into the past at the same time, the quantum time travel <laughs> or something like that. So so we are expecting to have another telescope joining us and for those of you just tuning in, uh, this is our celebration of the beginning of International Observe the Moon Night. We are bringing you a view from New Zealand that is coming from the wonderful telescope of Paul Stewart. I believe that we're currently looking through a 12 inch Mead telescope. Yes we are, we're looking at the Apollo 11 landing site. Oh that's brilliant. So this is the the sea of 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 I can't remember cause tranquility tranquility base. I think so. Um, so so uh, Scott is coming to you from the Pacific Time Zone in California. I'm coming to you from Southern Illinois in the middle of America in the Central Time Zone. Um, we welcome our global viewers and we are currently taking your questions on Twitter at the hashtag uh, Moon Knight and on YouTube and our Google events page. Um, we just got another question in from, and, and he told me how to pronounce his name, thank you so much, um, from Phoenix Jocks. He's asking, how deep into the moon have we studied using actual drilling, radar, gravity, and others? Um, radar is able to penetrate depending on the wavelength of radar that's used um, up to a few meters under the surface. Um, when it comes to drilling, not so much drilling has happened as just rock. Um, so, so we've picked things up off the surface. Um, robots have picked things up off the surface for the, for the Russians. Um, and uh, with gravity, well, we're able to pretty much probe the entire moon and map out its density variations using the GRAIL missions. Um, so gravity gives us the deepest understanding, but it, it's, it's an all or nothing. You can't tell as easily where the, 
differences in density occur along the distance from the center to the surface. Um, so, so we still have a lot, a lot to learn. Um, we also have approximately purified asking, uh, what are the latest thoughts and theories on transient lunar phenomena? So the, these are where we do see the flashes of light. Um, the dominant uh, theory cause for most of the ones that, that amateur astronomers are, are randomly observing is, oh, something just hit the moon. Um, there are others. Uh, there's, there's a researcher, um, Arlen, I just forgot his last name. He's at Columbia University, and um, he, he's been doing research trying to tie these to perhaps some sort of outgassing events where volatiles um, are released and give off a flash. Um, but the dominant thought is something just smacked the moon. The energy of impact turned into, among other things, also a flash of light. And then I think there's a guy in the History Channel that thinks aliens. No. Aliens, right? No. no. No aliens. No, no aliens. There there has been no signs of extraterrestrial intelligence yet, though no. we love our friends at SETI. We will we always still help them. Uh, the folks over at SETI are wonderful, wonderful people. who And they're doing hard, before. real science. That's right. It's As much as I love the book contact, there, it's not necessarily like the the movie, but the folks over at SETI are wonderful, and you are able to contribute in citizen science as well with the, the Boink pro program with the SETI at home, so you're able to turn your computer into into their data and help them go through it, but uh, you get to have more fun with us on CosmoQuest. That's so true. You can let your, your computer idle overnight and work with SETI, and then when you wake up, instead of playing Angry Birds, you can map the moon. Or Vesta. I mean, one of the awesome things is, is well, the moon is awesome. We uh, allow you to take looks at different geologic surfaces. So we, we also have a brand new project called Asteroid Mappers that allows you to take a look at this not so little asteroid that it has craters that are like nothing you've ever seen on the moon. It has, th this is an object that, that at some point was still squishy because it hadn't solidified all the way and was getting impacted and so you just end up with these wrinkled, gnarly surfaces for lack of a more scientific way of putting it. Um, I'm hoping to bring you new results on what caused Vesta to be such a completely screwed up terrain. Um, but we have a great question coming in from Carolyn McArdle. Um, she's, she says, if the gravity of the moon transfers energy to Earth's oceans to cause tides and the moon's gravity remains constant, where is the loss of energy? So, so the way to think of it isn't, uh, so yes, there is the gravitational force doing work on the oceans um, and, and the entire system over time is, is the moon is actually drifting slowly further and further away from the Earth. Um, due to all of these different forces going on. So there, there's lots of um, effects that we just don't notice because when the moon is moving away at a rate of millimeters a year, um, it's an effect that builds up over time. Um, in general, the energy of the tidal effects is, is it's not negligible, but it's not as big as you'd think when you start looking at how much energy there could be from the forces of the gravity of the two bodies acting on one another. So we, we also have, go ahead Scott. I was just saying great questions again. You guys yeah. are, you're, you're letting us off to a great start because this is going to be not 24 hours straight, but through the next 24 hours because we don't want to die doing this. But and, and we will be swapping off most of the humans, but not Scott. So I have to give major kudos to Scott. He organized this. He got all of the different speakers lined up. He was patient enough to work with the fact that tonight Nicole Gallucci is traveling to Pennsylvania. Uh, tomorrow I'm traveling to Madrid. And so he had to juggle everything to, to make this happen. And it's Major for class. science. Why it's not? For science. It's for science. We should always we should always have international events for no matter what we're doing because <laughs> it, it is an style. international endeavor. Yeah. It's all ours. 
let's see here. Just going back to Twitter. Um, is we have Phoenix Jocks again. Uh, do we have picks anywhere near the quality of those of Vesta from any other asteroids for study? Not well. No. <laughs> I started to say no, not really. Um, we have really good images of a couple of, of asteroids, but Vesta is so big and the resolution of the images is so good that it allows us to do types of studies of the whole body that we've never been able to do before. So we have very good images of, of well, we've all probably seen Ida and Dactyl, um, we have very good images of several different asteroids, but Vesta is the only one where we, where we have very good images of the entire asteroid. That will change in 2015 when Dawn gets to Ceres. And yeah, Dawn just left Vesta. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the soap opera going on with these these asteroids is fairly recent. I think she departed what the fifth of September. Um, it was a, it was on a Saturday. She was abandoned on a Saturday afternoon. Nothing good happens in relationships on Saturdays. Sorry, no. kids. Especially when, you know, it's a hard rock life out there. <laughs> and I'll keep the puns coming. It's it's one thirty in the morning for me, so but three thirty for for Pamela, so yeah. Peter, set your telescope up. I'm Come on, Peter, up where are you for at? You, Peter. <laughs> um Let's see, Eddie, Eddie Led Better on Twitter asked to discuss libration, which is really, really cool. We don't necessarily think about libration too much on a no. daily basis, but it's a really interesting concept if you're not used to thinking about looking at the moon and what it's doing, or what we're doing on Earth, actually. So, so when you, when you look at the moon over a long period of time, and Universe Today just released a really great app that shows this. I, I can't see myself, so I don't know if this is coming across. But... Um, tilt it down a little bit. Tilt. The, yeah, there you go. And this exists for both iOS and Android operating systems. Um, so this is something that, that my awesome co-host, Fraser Kane, and um, some of the programmers that are near and dear to him uh, worked on putting together and it, it goes through and it, it shows over the course of a month how the size of the moon in the sky changes as, as the distance to the moon changes. It shows how, depending on the exact alignment, you can actually see slight differences in, in the alignment of the, the pole of the Earth and the moon um, that allow us to see a little bit more or a little bit less of the northern and southern poles. And also, because the orbit's an ellipse, um, sometimes it's racing a little bit faster forward in its orbit, and so we get to tip around this edge and see a little bit more, and sometimes it's moving a little bit slower in its orbit, and we get to see a little bit around the other end. And so there's all these slight variations in alignment um, such that by the end of the month we've been able to see more than 50% of the moon. Right, I believe we see around 59% of the moon over one month, so over one orbit that the moon takes around us. We see 59%, but we can only see 50% at a time because yeah. it is a sphere. But over the course of a month we do see about 59% of the moon up there. And I believe, I don't know about iOS, but for you Android folks out there, it's 99 cents for this. It's um, Phases of the Moon, it's put out by Universe Today. Yeah. 99 cents is a steal because it not only is pretty, as I showed you, it is pretty, but it gives you um, what phase it's in, the amount, the percentage that is illuminated, the approximate the distance in kilometers that it is away from the Earth and how old it is. So it's always like, my moon is seven days old. <laughs> Even though we just discussed it's billions of years old. But it's, it's how many days phase, of new moon. And, and that, that's, right. that's extremely important if you live in a Muslim um, uh, country where your calendar is set by, by the lunar phases. And who is most able to see that, that first sliver of moon appearing in the sky. 
which is always really pretty. Seeing just that tiny little peak yeah. coming off, it's really neat. Uh, Paul, what's what's the youngest moon you've been ab ever able to make out? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't really think of the youngest one. Have, have you ever Which challenged way? yourself to find that, that one in a something day old moon? Not yet, but I might give it a go now. <laughs> <laughs> We're giving Paul so many great ideas. This is awesome. It, it's something that I've tried to do. Um, the, the barn where I, I keep my horse, I, I don't have children, I have a thoroughbred. Um, the, the barn where I keep my horse, uh, it's, it's aligned beautifully east-west. You can, you can tell when equinox is because the sunlight comes streaming down the center of the, the barn aisle. And uh, it's nice to go, go out at the end of a ride and uh, look for that sliver of moon as the sun sets. So that's one of my hobbies. And I, I've never seen anything that was less than a couple of days old, but I keep trying. <laughs> Um, let's see here. We have Mr. Umalaka on uh, on YouTube. That is there any appetite to send a Curiosity type rover to the moon to look at rocks or maybe for water ice? The the moon is something we do want to send rovers to. Um, a Mars Curiosity like rover um, is probably overkill. With, with Mars, there's a, a complex chemistry to the surface where there is water, there is methane being detected, there are carbon molecules. And NASA has been following and working with the European Space Agency as it does it. It's, it's been working to follow a follow the water plan of discovery. So I, when we first sent Pathfinder, the, the little tiny rover that landed 4th of July back in, I think, the late 90s, um, it was a prototype to figure out, can we land bouncy ball rovers and have them survive the experience and do explorations? From there, we went on to uh, Mars, uh, Spirit, and Opportunity. And um, sorry, there's a giant bug trying to get into my office to join me on this 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 webcast. Um, so it's from there we went to Mars, uh, Spirit, and Opportunity that um, are are looking at the mineralogy, and some of our orbital spacecraft have the ability to uh, look at um, various types of emissions coming from the surface that are related to well X-rays interacting with soils that contain waters and and sending back neutrons in reactions, sending back gamma rays in reactions. Um, so, so all of these different uh, reactions um, that we look at, whether it's the gamma rays that trigger some of the things we see, not detecting gamma rays. Um, so we're, we're trying to find the water. With, with Mars Curiosity, Mars Science Laboratory, or as Mars ro rover driver calls it, George. George. Um, as, as George roves across the surface, uh, he or she has the ability to not just follow the water that was found by Phoenix, but to also um, start looking for the carbon molecules, looking for the minerals that say, at some point, the chemistry on the surface of Mars was the type of chemistry that's necessary to support life as we understand it here on Earth. Now we don't confine our imaginings to life being just like on Earth. But when designing experiments, we have to start somewhere. And the somewhere we chose to start was assuming that the, the carbon basis of life that we experience here is similar to the carbon basis of life experienced on Mars. And I just got word Peter will be joining us momentarily. He is getting all set up, so I just need to send him the invite link again. Excellent. So, so Peter Lake is one of our regulars in the Virtual Star Party, and he works with the iTelescope program. And iTelescope is a great way for anyone to log on to a telescope anywhere, well, not anywhere, log on to telescopes in a variety of different locations scattered about the planet and be able to take advantage of great optics without having to move great optics. If you've ever watched our Virtual Star Party video, there's this great uh, 
section where you see uh, Mike Rector uh, pushing his telescope up the hill and I know Stuart Foreman has been a real trooper for us uh, where, where Fraser's been, I want to see! And Stuart's like, oh, I have to pick up my telescope and move it to the other side of the house. Um, so, so we do do a lot of crazy things for our hobby and sometimes, well, if you're like me, you just get lazy and so you log on. So iTelescope allows you to be lazy and log on to the sky. And I also here um, with, uh, about rovers, uh, Stuart Young just mentioned too that there is the Google Lunar X Prize. And there's also something called Lunar, um, Lunabotics by, by NASA here, which is a competition for people across the, the states to come up with their own um, robot to, that would do a certain task. And I believe it's 10 kilos of rock. It needs to be able to gather 10 kilos of um, of moon rock and be able to do something with it. So they have these school competitions, even private groups that build a robot that could be sent to the moon, which is awesome. It's so cool. I, I love that people are out there building moon robots because they can. And maybe because the they can. Someday. Because well, they can. What, what I love is the Google Lunar X Prize was written in a very vague way where it says you have to get something to the moon, have it go a set distance that I think is, is either 100 meters or 500 meters, and then send back a video to Earth. And, and in my perfect little world, it's one of those like and, and um, yeah, I mean, imagine the YouTube videos. That would be the <laughs> best possible way to get kids engaged and wanting to do robots, wanting to learn how to code and and do all of the great things that, that will revolutionize how we interact with our environment. And with, about George from the, the Mars rover driver, uh, that's Scott Maxwell, for those that yeah. don't know. Wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting him. But George comes from the name Curiosity and the story of Curious George, so the, the children's it. book. And so now Curiosity is now George. So Wait, that's, when that's one of the things I love is I have yet to hear a NASA person who wasn't forced uh, or had expectations refer to Mars Science Laboratory as curiosity. <laughs> they just don't call it that. It's yeah. awesome. Watch them. It's fun. It's, it's a hobby I have now. <laughs> well, yeah, being there, it was, it was always... It's always MSL. There's always something else going on. Yeah, it's always yeah. MSL. It's the Mars Science Laboratory, but they they you know Curiosity is this name for it, but they have much more. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's much more affection for it through MSL than having to call it Curiosity, and it's like Curiosity is too cute of a name. They love it too much to call it this name, and then they'll come up with their own name for it, like yeah. like Scott did with George. George. Because of course, well, it, it's and and the moon is moving. Um, I I love how we're right in an area where there's these mountains surrounded by smooth lava seas. This is a really beautiful region. You can see the streaks coming off of that isolated crater in the lava. Um, yeah, it's it's a really really beautiful image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's funny how just conversation sometimes changes the name of things. I, I was doing an interview one day, and I, I, it's, it's either James Webb Space Telescope or JWST, and I kept calling it the James WST. <laughs> and it eventually, by the end of the conversation, with Twitter involved, became Jim the Space Telescope. And, and I, I like the idea of calling James Webb Space Telescope Jim. <laughs> See, telescope I always... Jim. I always, with the James Webb, I always called it Jack Webb by mistake. Just and which still has an attitude now, you know. Yeah. It's got some swagger. And I'm like, yeah, Jack Webb, of course. Just the facts. And <laughs> <laughs> that's it's it's great and how just 
common mistakes in our horrible way of, of speaking as I'm stumbling over myself talking about this fact. But we are able to come up with some wonderful stories that have nothing to do with anything. But we love it anyway. And that's scientists are huge dorks. We're huge dorks, or at least most of us are. And we will actually admit to it. No, um, we just have our own subculture that other people have labeled as being dorks. Um, yes. I mean, the, the thing to think about is everyone has their own special geek. Some people geek about football. And they don't tend to call it geeking about football. Um, we geek about the moon and, and looking at this image that we have here um, you can see the atmosphere making it tremble but up in the upper left there's this great beautifully round crater that has a dimple in the center and, and craters like this form with so much energy that it liquefies and splatters upwards and is still coming back down and peaked as it solidifies. So this is the frozen splash. If, if you've ever watched any of the, the ultra slow motion milk drop, milk drop splashes, that's the frozen um, bounce in the center of the milk drop. And that is a it's a fantastic crater. It's very the smooth and, edges on there, and, and I, I love yeah, perfectly in the center. I love it. Sorry, my phone um, <laughs> is getting banished. Um, and and what's interesting about this this image is you can see there's the two nearby craters that have very very similar diameters, um, but they're not the same depth. And so there, there's an infilling process going in, um, and, we, and we can see, well, lava flowed across this surface. And, and so that deeper crater is probably a significantly young crater that formed after the infilling process that, that filled those other two nearby systems. And, and this is what geology is all about, figuring out what got formed before what and how. <laughs> It, it's much more complicated. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm an astronomer, and, and you don't have to learn about anything chemically more complicated than, well, pure atoms for most of what I've done. Um, right. There's lots of molecules in the interstellar media, but I restricted myself to stars and galaxies. <laughs> um, restricted to a galaxy. Yes. Well, yeah. I, I did study magnesium hydride isotopic ratios for two years, and, and I was done with molecules after that. <laughs> um, so so when, when people study geology, they, they have to understand when they're dealing with, with planets, they have to understand the context of astronomy where you have a star that's had different energy outputs over its entire history. You have to understand the effects of, of solar flares, of the solar winds. Uh, you have to then know how to do the thermal modeling of a cooling body that's embedded with radioactive materials that are decaying and generating heat. It's amazingly complicated from the chemistry, from the physics, from the dynamics, from thinking about the hydrology effects when you're dealing with bodies like Europa or the poles on um, Mars and, and all the other icy bodies in between. Um, it's a complicated subject and my hat is off to all of these men and women are able to keep keep track of what are all of the different rock names, where are all the different chemistry names, and what are all the missions res responding to their their scientific questions with all sorts of different data types. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it. I I too love the, the stars and the galaxies, and I my uh, Dr. David Carey at Citrus College. He he loves planetary sciences and the geology goes on and it just goes just blows me away. I, I, I can't pay attention to you for too long, Dave. I, I love listening to you talk, but I, I can't, it's, it's far too complicated for me, which is w weird because I, going over spectroscopy and everything like that, it can get a little complicated, but thinking about how the, just the formation of one planet, which actually is more, a little more simpler than formation of galaxies. You're just talking about one teeny tiny little dot within a dot and yeah I mean it's fascinating there's so much goes goes on there and it, it definitely is a windmill to tilt that yeah to and to yeah and and just simple things like 
I've had three different planetary scientists try and explain to me how it is that we end up with pockets of silver and pockets of gold within the planet instead of just like a well-mixed batter that formed a planet. Um, and, and I can parrot back the words and understand, no, not understand, I can parrot back the big picture of what happened, but the honest understanding that comes from, from deeply understanding the, the hows and whys of the different parts um, is, is still black magic to me, it's still stuff I'm trying <laughs> to understand. So there, there's always new things to be learning. Um, we, we have Eddie Ledbetter asking in Twitter, um, please talk about the future possibility of human exploration on the moon given the trend toward robotics today. Well, there's, there's two different trends right now. There's scientists who desperately just want their data, please, please, we want data, and robots are cheap. Uh, robots don't weigh that much compared to humans and the food and the air and the radiation protection. And they don't so, clean that much. No, they don't. Um, <laughs> al al although they do cause Vesta to complain when she gets left by dawn. It's um, true. Sorry, this is the running joke of the evening for those <laughs> of you who are just joining in. Um, so, so I think in terms of trying to get the most science for our dollar, we're going to keep using robots for a while for science. But the thing about the moon is it's right there. Right. And, and we have the ability with commercial space to say, let's go because we can. Let's land humans, build that for-profit hotel, and use some of the profits to fund science, to, to get scientists there to give the tea time lectures, and then go out and dig in the rocks and send their results back to Earth. There, there is a natural curiosity. Why do people climb Mount Everest? It's been done, but they still want to do it for themselves, even though they risk their life every time they do it, and people continue to die on Everest. Well, it, as Everest gets well commercialized, the moon's the next big step. Um, it's, it's going to be the new Everest for the wealthy who wish to explore well, New Horizons. Um, and I think that's what's going to get people there. And just as scientists have gone to Everest to understand how the human body reacts to extreme conditions, to uh, basically put sensors at the top of the mountain, as all of these things happen, well, I think the same thing's going to happen on the moon. Now, I know that Scott's been having a lot of technological difficulties at his house. Uh, his, his internet provider hasn't been treating him so kindly, so I'm afraid we might have just lost him. Um, we are waiting to be joined by Peter Lake. Uh, with me now is Paul Stewart. We are entering, um, well, we're, we're almost two hours into this, our first uh, virtual moon party to welcome you into the International Observe the Moon Night. Um, I, I am experiencing 3.40 in the morning and Astro Sets on Twitter is experiencing with me as he, as he tweets, um, it's 3.40 a.m. and I should probably go to bed watching the Moon Watch Moon Night Virtual Star Party. Uh, hard to sleep, but I must. Yeah, I, I'm feeling your pain, but thanks for coming and joining us while you could. I know I'm going to truly be help hating myself tomorrow when, when I'm shoving myself onto an airplane. Um, but this is worth it. This is getting to share the moon with the globe. Um, the moon is being brought to you from New Zealand, um, showing us that, yeah, it is one planet, one sky, one moon. Um, and we're currently creeping up on one of the eyeballs of the old man in the moon. Um, Paul, uh, can, can you explain what you're doing right now? At the moment I'm just driving the telescope manually just around the moon. Do you have any favorite corners that you like to explore? Oh, mainly along the Terminator when you've got a bit of contrast to look at. Yeah, so, so what's, what's nice is when you are looking towards the edge of the illuminated part, the, the sun is hitting at a steep angle. Um, and you actually get to, as you look around the moon, 
um, see the equivalent of going from noon with the sun straight overhead to twilight with the sun off on the edge of the horizon and you can see this in the craters where as we go around the terminator you don't see these starkly shadowed craters the same way you do not as we go around the terminator as we go around the edge as we go around the edge of the moon you don't see sharply shadowed craters we only see those sharply shadowed craters when Paul scans the telescope along that boundary between day and night on the surface of the moon. And I missed you guys, so I came back. We, we deeply <laughs> appreciate it. Let's see if I can get my comment tracker working again. My internet's been going out, so it's been a, a feat getting this going. <laughs> So so we have Phoenix Jocks on Twitter asking, how much money currently and in the future will be coming from rich people wanting to go to places versus research grants? It, it's hard to tell. I'm actually banking part of my career, and I didn't mean that to be a pun. It just came out of my mouth, and I realized it was. Um, I, I'm actually aligning part of my career with the hope that people will, um, not necessarily rich people, but people in general will will choose to spend money in ways that, that allows the profits to be reinvested into space research. There's, there's a project, if you go to indiagogo.com, called Uwingu, U-W-I-N-G-U, that is working on raising $75,000 in startup funds and using that money to pay for insurance, to pay for accountants, to pay for all the stupid costs that come with starting a business in the United States. Um, just licensing the name is a thousand, well it's over a thousand dollars actually. Um, but once we've raised that $75,000 in startup funds, we're going to, to launch a online company that is, I'm under NDA so I can't say very much, um, but I'm one of the people programming the website for this. Um, it gamifies space and uh, the the best analogy I have, and it's a really bad analogy, but it's as good as I'm going to get, and this is not how our software works. I'm just reaching here. But if, if you've ever seen people spend money in Farmville, imagine that the money you spent in Farmville was actually getting used to fund agricultural research. Well, we're creating our own gamification of space that is nothing like Farmville, I promise you. <laughs> Um, we're, we're creating our own way of gamifying space and the proceeds of the money that you spend within what we're creating for a Wingu um, is going to get turned around to use at a minimum 50% and hopefully much more than 50% is going to go to funding global communities of researchers. This is not a United States program. This is a global program. And, and so we're hoping that people will choose to spend their money in ways that reinvest it in, in, in discovering our universe. Uh, so that, that's over at indiagogo.com. The project is Uwingu, U-W-I-N-G-U. And we're now looking at an older section of the moon that's just covered in craters. And, and you can see what I mean by the, the shadows get much starker as we get over towards the edge. Uh, I don't know if you saw there. Um, can you invite Peter in real quick? Oh, yeah. There he is. So hopefully we'll have another telescope joining us shortly. And, and Paul's been fantastic. Kudos to you, Paul. You are doing wonderful. Your images are beautiful and you can chime in and talk with us as well you had enough time driving the telescope and all the controls <laughs> at the same time it, it, it's yeah one of those I, I don't know about the two of you but I can walk and read texts but I don't know how many times I've been happily walking along and then literally stopped in my tracks to start writing a response which as long as I'm inside my own house is a perfectly safe thing to do but there's other places it's not as safe to do it <laughs> so yeah it's I don't know if you answered this but um, Caroline McCradle again asked about as the move away from 
as the moon moves away from Earth, will lose its synchronous orbit or synchronous rotation and allow us to see parts of the surface we don't see now. No, that that's actually one of the interesting things about the fact that our moon isn't a, um, we just finished two hours, my software, uh, I have software that changes the color of my screen and it <laughs> keeps going out, so we just finished two hours of recording. Um, so, so as the moon drifts away, it's it's not a perfect sphere, and and so, its its elongated direction is pointing towards the Earth, and if it tries to move, the gravitational torque is going to spin it right back. So as it's moving away, it will keep that that, um, it'll stay balanced so that it's in its lowest gravity orientation. Now one of the interesting things that is going to happen is the Earth itself is also slowing down so that eventually um, if it wasn't for the fact that the Sun is eventually going to to expand and broil the Earth-Moon system rather radically, um, it, it, if the Sun wasn't there to expand eventually the Earth itself, its rotation would slow down such that the same side of the Earth always faced the Moon and, and only half of our planet would have the ability to ever see the moon, and days would be, uh, well, the equivalent of, of tens of current day lengths in length. You get really hot and really cold. But yeah, I, it, it'd, it'd be really interesting to be staring at the moon for days on end, that, that being your source. That, that would be wonderful. <laughs> not, not, the, not the environmental problem that happens. Yeah, it, yeah the environmental but, problems are kind of severe. Yes. You know, like dying, but no, little was, things. You know, life. <laughs> but no, I it just I, I think there was a video a few years back. It gets shared around every once in a while, and is if if the Earth had the like rings like on Saturn and what that would look like. Just thinking about your perspective from a different planetary body. That would be really, really cool on just yeah. being able to look at the moon always being there. and You're always staring back. It's always there. But the rings, too, are really pretty when they put them up. Yeah, it's it, we're, unless we have an asteroid catastrophe, we're never going to have rings. We're certainly never going to have icy rings like Saturn no. has. No. Um, but it's, it's interesting to look out across the, the galaxy, and as we see this diversity of, well, roughly a thousand planets have now been discovered. Mm -hmm. um, as we look out at this diversity, um, we start to be able to imagine fertile moons that have that Ewok civilization on them. Um, that's not an, an impossible idea. And we used to always talk about the habitable zone around stars, which is that area where the uh, light of the sun, the light of that star, is capable of keeping water liquid on the surface of a planet. But we now know from looking at Titan, we now know from looking at Europa, that it's possible to tidally heat moons, and, and there's other ways to create that liquid that we look for when we look for life. So the, the places that we start to, to look, um, they keep getting more and more extensive. And so now the only real question is, we know the conditions for liquid water are, are numerous. Um, does life form easily is the question we still have no way of answering. Right. Uh, I, I think that we'll have much more information on that some, at some point within my lifetime. I, I really do, at least of ruling out major, fat, you know, major points. I, I, at least my hope, I know that planetary exploration is being slashed right now as far yeah. as funding in the U.S., but I, I just I hold on to that hope. I'm waiting for that huge announcement. I'm, I'm waiting, and I know Scott probably won't, but maybe Scott Maxwell will text me and say, hey, man, look what we just found. But that would I, be so would be, awesome. I, <laughs> I don't think we're going to find life, but I, I, I could just imagine someday the overexcited rover driver of whatever world is being roved upon, just texting the first announcement to a friend. Right. Because how awesome is that? You know, yeah. Because they're, they're people just... You know, like the rest of us, they just have yeah. went to a special, you know, they 
did training, uh, school, um, software engineering. And scientists uh, don't keep secrets well, really. All those people <laughs> who think about conspiracy theories do not know scientists. Oh, we... Uh, Lots of talking, lots of a lot of, of one-upmanship as well. Yes, yeah. lots of drinking. Yes, lots of that too. And the, the, there's a lot of passion that goes along with their field of research. Yeah. And it would be impossible to be so passionate about what you're doing and keep quiet without a legal order to do so. You know, facing jail time if you don't shut your mouth. Well, even then, you tell your spouse. So yeah, even of course. If it's, I, yeah, scientists are not to be trusted. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, okay, we, we are coming up on 4 a.m. Central Time, 5 a.m. Eastern, uh, uh, 10 a.m. London, uh, 9 p.m. where you are in New Zealand, Paul? That's right. And uh, as the world turns, um, the moon is is now up over New Zealand, parts of Africa. Um, it's it's not quite over meaningful parts of Europe yet, but it's working on getting there. And I'm just getting messaged by Peter because I know that his telescope um, in Australia is not set up for imaging. So he was, or with the, his camera, so he was going to be using his iPhone with his eyepiece. Yeah. Since it's an on-air hangout, <gasps> They're iOS, not letting is, him. iOS is not compatible with the, oh, no. the hangouts on air. Okay. So, okay. We may we may lose Peter. Um, if, if we're not going to be bringing Peter in, um, I have to leave for Madrid in seven hours. Um, so I, I think we will take a few more questions and then call it a morning, call it an yes. evening, call it a day, and a celebration of International Observe the Moon Night. And we'll be starting up here in a few more hours. I'm waiting for confirmation from a few more astronomers. Um, but it will most likely be maybe in five hours if I hear back for confirmation from um, Shara Numer from Malaysia. Well, still waiting on that because I do need to get, get some sleep as well for this marathon. But hopefully, we'll be seeing you on here on Cosmo Quest. If not, all of our recording, or all of our broadcasts are being recorded on our um, YouTube page, and I believe it's also up on CosmoQuest.org as well. So all of these videos will end up at Astrosphere Vids, which is the channel that CosmoQuest posts all of its videos at. You can see this, you can see past virtual star parties, you can watch episodes of Astronomy Cast built, being filmed live, which means you get to see all of my mistakes. Um, we, we try and bring you as many different ways of learning and doing science as we can. Uh, so join us later today, tomorrow, depending on your time zone and whether you've slept or not, uh, to continue our celebrations of International Observe the Moon Night. We will be bringing you uh, hangouts from the Franklin Institute uh, if we're able to. Uh, that's in Pennsylvania and the Americas. Uh, we will be bringing you um, a celebration at a custard stand here in Edwardsville, Illinois, so you can see how it gets celebrated in small town USA. Uh, from Malaysia, from Turkey, weather willing, from England, um, we're making this global. If you yes. have a telescope and you want to get involved, um, drop a note to Scott Lewis yes. on Google Plus or to Bald Astronomer on Twitter. Same guy. Same me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some days. And, and if you want to join us for future events, uh, become part of CosmoQuest at CosmoQuest.org. Uh, we offer classes every Wednesday afternoon. We have a seminar. Well, Wednesday afternoon, U.S. time, we have a seminar um, where we try and bring you um, a conversation with a leading scientist, a uh, leading astronomer, uh, astronomy, planetary science educator, or uh, talk to someone who's working on, well, it takes administrators and politicians and bureaucrats as well to do the things we do. Uh, Thursday morning, we do the Science News Roundup at 10 a.m. Pacific time. 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 
5, 6 p.m. Uh, London, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the Sydney times on these things. And then Sunday nights at a time that varies wildly depending on weather and when the sun finally sets. Uh, we do our virtual star parties. You can learn about everything we do by following us on Twitter at at CosmoQuestX. Um, I'm Dr. Pamela Gay, and with me is Scott Lewis. And um, we're the CosmoQuest team, and this is made possible thanks to the volunteer efforts of Paul Stewart, who's bringing us his view from down under um, from, from New Zealand. Do you have any parting words for us, Paul? Just look up and wink at the moon. And if you think about it, raise a toast to the astronauts and robots who've brought us back the rocks and have done so much to help us understand this nearby body. Absolutely. So thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Stay tuned. More coverage to come. Good night or good morning.